are listening to the East Coast Sisterhood Podcast, where women are inspired, encouraged, and loved. If you are a woman, you are sisterhood. Welcome, and thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Jeannie Terry. We're continuing to bring you stories that align with East Coast vision of one step, one savior, one soul. And we are still very fresh off Flourish Refined, Brevard's anointed women's conference that took place on October 11th and 12th. This is part one of a two-part series. My guest today was a table hostess at the conference, and today she is sharing her story of a fairly recent trial that has refined her in her personal and spiritual journey. She's a Florida native, born and raised in Orlando. She has been married for 17 years, and she moved to Brevard County when she married marvelous Marvin Alderman, who is the provost at East Coast Christian University. She has six kids. Well, they have six kids and five grandbabies. Please welcome Selena Alderman. Thank you for being here, Selena. Thank you. I'm so delighted to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. First, I have to ask you, what did you enjoy most about the conference? So tell me or tell me your testimony about the conference. Well, let's see. On Friday, um, I found myself all by myself at home, and uh, that never never happens. And I was getting ready for the evening and uh, drying my hair and putting my makeup on, and all of a sudden, I just felt Holy Spirit all over me. And uh, I stopped for a moment, and I could see women just worshiping and praising God, Mm -hmm. and women being delivered from all kinds of burdens in their life. It just excited me so much. By the time I got there, I was on fire. (laughs) I was ready. (laughs) Nice. And you mentioned um, about something about tears, about the the um, oh yes, some of the speakers on the stage. Wasn't that wonderful? Um, There was not one person, not one speaker that was able to step onto that stage that was not just overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. Each one of them got up there and cried their eyes out. I know. Um, the women everywhere were swishing the tissue. They, yeah. uh, it was just a beautiful experience. You could just feel Holy Spirit's presence was so tangible. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I feel like what was going on on stage was simply what was represented in the audience. And I remember Chadi, when she was crying or tearing during her presentation, she said, do not mistake my tears for weakness, which I thought was so appropriate. Um, and Psalm thirty four fifteen says uh, that the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. So I believe that there is power and victory with Jesus in our tears. She so. definitely, her heart was toward God that whole evening and the next day as well. I, I, neither day could someone get up there and speak without just being influenced by the Holy Spirit and crying. It was beautiful. I agree. It was a beautiful, beautiful display of affection towards God. Selena, now I met you when you used to attend the Vieira campus. Actually, the very first person we met was your husband. He greeted me and my family at the door of the Rave Movie Theater. And boy, do I miss that theater with their super plush seats, the huge cup holders. But I am so thankful that now we have our own land to build our new Vieira campus. Anyways, for years, I remember seeing you and Marvin and your super energetic and smiling children, Maranatha, Iman, and Kirby. I remember seeing Kirby and Iman even involved as interns and Kirby playing the guitar on the worship team. Tell me, when did you all leave Vieira and where have you been? Well, we left Vieira about three years ago or so. Um, we had been there since the launch date and serving. We love serving, um, breaking out the black boxes every Sunday morning, <laughs> packing them back up again. It was wonderful. What was um, in those black boxes for people who might not know? Everything we needed. Because why? Why were service. things in black boxes? Was this because we were a... Um, well, campus yeah, in a box. So that's to speak. right, right. Yeah. yeah, there was nothing at the obviously at a movie theater for us to get settled. So we had to pack everything out of a box to have children's church, to have worship team, to have production, sound. Everything came from boxes. Um, it was exciting to set it all up and see it all put down again. But um, we felt that it was time to move on to the Coco campus, which we had just re- been established at that point. It hadn't been going for very long. So we left about three years ago, and we've been at the Coco campus since. So you've been at Coco campus for three years now, but you and Marvin been, have been around much longer than that, haven't you? Yes. Um, Marvin, he's been coming for about 30 years, maybe more. <laughs> And uh, I I started coming right after right when we got married. We got married in two thousand two, so it's been about seventeen years, more than 
a little over 17 years. That is a long time, 17 years. I am sure you have seen people grow up in this church right before your very eyes. Speaking of which, I'm sure over the course of 17 years, you've served in many different capacities throughout all the campuses. Can you talk to us about where you've served? Sure. Um, well, when I first started here, I was pretty intimidated by it all. So I started just serving in the nursery, and then I kind of built up to four- and five-year-olds. Um, and then I got a job at uh, East Coast as the receptionist in the office, and uh, that opened up all kinds of opportunities. I met so many different people. Um, one that really comes to mind, though, is Pastor Dorothy Mounts. I met her, and she she would just tell me all about what she did, her the homeless men on the streets and how she was ministering to them, and that really resonated with me. So I asked her what I could do to help, and she says, you can cook a meal once a month. Mm-hmm. And so I did. I cook a big, huge pot of taco soup um, one Saturday every month for about six years. And... Uh, I also helped her to um, launch the or- Overlook Bible Training Center. If you've heard of that, oh. it is a wonderful in-resident program for men who are addicted. It's One Step Jesus. Uh, this is not a commercial for Overlook Ministries, <laughs> but it really just changed the way I looked at people. Um, so I'm just still stuck on the you cooked a meal once every month on it was a Saturday. So exciting. I loved it. Tell me more about that. I mean, yeah, it, you just go, they had a place where the, the people would come out of the woods and what? meet and they every, they expect it every Saturday and still do. This has been going on for many, many years. Um, they've been on the streets for, of Brevard for over 21 years. So they've been doing this thing. It's beautiful to watch these people come out and hear the word. And get now, a bite. so so when you say come out of the woods, is it like, are the, do they have several stations set up around Brevard County or is this one location no. where the homeless, is this just homeless men? It is just, well, it's all homeless people on Saturday that come out of the woods and get a bite to eat. And it's just one station in Coco, but they all know about it. And wow. so it, it's really just the people that are in that area. Obviously, they're on bicycles, so people aren't going to come across all of Brevard County, but in the Cocoa area, they come out and have a meal and hear about Jesus. Wow. It's, it's that's awesome. amazing. And that's been going on for 21 years? <clears throat> yes. They've been saying? on the street for over 21 years. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. So at the beginning of the year, uh, well, I got to tell you, when we were working on Overlook, we adopted children, and all of a sudden I had three more children at home, and it became a little too much. So I had to tabled that for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, And then at the beginning of the year, uh, Pastor Kevin had asked us to step in and do some leadership building in the Cocoa Campus. And um, we said yes, um, which is what we're supposed to do, right? (laughs) The big yes. We said yes. It wasn't a hard yes. So we stepped up and just did our best to build up teams, build up leaders for those teams. Uh, We were having a lot of fun with it. But just a couple of weeks later, Pastor Kevin became very ill. And uh, the executive team here at the church asked Marvin if he would step in and just keep things moving forward until Pastor Kevin could get back in the saddle. But uh, Pastor Kevin's um, recovery was very lengthy. It Mm -hmm. took months and months. And um, by that time, there was a whole new calling on his life to move into the pastoral care. He's developing a whole new pastoral care team um, to reach out to people who are in need. And so Marvin has remained there as the interim pastor uh, and just, you know, doing what a pastor does and keeping things going there. It's been a thrilling experience for both of us. We make a great team out there. Um, so, yeah, that was our opportunity, and we said yes to it. It's great. You, you guys do make a great team. I agree with that statement very much. So um, you mentioned earlier, or we mentioned, that you and Marvin have six kids. You did just mention uh, adopting. You adopted three children. Of those six kids, three were adopted. Can you tell us what prompted you to adopt after having a full house, so to speak? That's a funny question because when we got married, Marvin says, listen, listen, woman. Listen, listen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want any more children. Mm-hmm. She had three children and they had all they were all in the teenage years. So he was almost finished with children, you know, having them at home. But uh, I had never had kids and I was really happy with the 
agreement that we had when we were dating for those three months and got married. Three months? <laughs> yes, three oh, months. that's going to be another story. <laughs> I want to hear that one. It's fun. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so I was happy with that. I was not pressuring him to have more children, but there was something in my heart that I would go on the internet and I'd look at a, a children up for adoption or in foster care, and it was just just something that I couldn't let go of. Mm. And so um, one day, I just we had a conversation, and mm. it was just not a manipulative thing. It was just a conversation about what if we could adopt children who were really just the most unfortunate and needed parents and needed a place, you know? Mm-hmm. And he says, that's really the only way I think I would consider adopting. Mm-hmm. And so uh, nine months later, this man comes back to me and says, you know, I've been praying about that adoption thing, and I think we're supposed to adopt. And I'm thinking, I'm ready to buy a boat. <laughs> <laughs> boat, so, children, yes, boat, children. We chose the children. <laughs> Both are money pits. Probably the, <laughs> probably the boat pits. is the bigger money pit, but we chose the children. So another yes. God called us to adopt these three children, and we said yes. And so that's pretty much, I, I, I tell you, I can tell you how we met these children. It is a tell pretty, us. pretty yes. cool story. Tell us, please. Um, so I was sitting at the front desk at East Coast being my receptionist thing, mm-hmm. and Sheree Shropshire walked in, and she says, hey, Selena, how's that adoption thing going? Mm-hmm. And we had had several, like four or five opportunities to adopt, and they all fell through. And I said, well, it's not really going anywhere. And she goes, well, I know a place in Haiti where you can go and adopt children. And I said, oh, international adoption is so expensive. Mm-hmm. She says, no, really, it's very, they make it very affordable. You really should get some more information. And I said, well, give me some more information. So she did. Mm-hmm. And um, she said, Terrell Watkins is going on a missions trip in a few weeks and see if you can tag on to that missions trip. And so I did. And Terrell says, no, I have full, I have a full group already, so you can't go. But one of the girls, um, Carrie Humphreys, she happened to have difficulty getting her passport. Mm. And so she could not go. At the very last minute, I had just been on a cruise with Marv, so I had my passport in hand and I had the money in hand, and they slipped me in there at the last wow. minute. Wow. Um, so here I am with these mezzanine girls. And, Wait, uh, describe. What's a mezzanine girl? I don't, I don't know oh, if everyone knows girls, yes. what that means. So mezzanine at East Coast Christian Center is the church for 18 to 30 years old. Mm-hmm. And married, unmarried, doesn't matter. Okay. 18 to 30 years old. That's where we don't, we're not going to get lost when we graduate from high school. Yeah. That is it's a monumental ministry in our, yeah. in our church. Um, anyway, so I'm off here with these mezzanine girls and... Um, <laughs> They're so precious. And the first day, uh, the lady comes to me and says, oh, you're the one that wants to adopt. And I'm like, yes. And so every who day, said, who said this that is Barbara, Walter, Barbara Walker out at Ruska Village in, in Bon Repo, Haiti. So the, wait, the woman that was in Haiti at the orphanage, did you say? Yes. Mm-hmm. Looked at you and said, you're the one? Yes. So she had heard. <laughs> that she we were heard. looking for adopting. Okay. <clears throat> which now is wait, what she's... can we go back? I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, mm-hmm. Did you go specifically to go to that? Adop- what was this mission yes. trip about? I don't well, know if their you... mission trip, okay. I was the tag along. Their okay. mission trip was to go and just love on babies okay. and to do whatever they could around the village to help, you know, uh, but pretty much just to love on babies, just mm. to love on the children because there's so many kids there waiting to be adopted. So I came along with the idea that, wait, maybe somebody there needs to be adopted. Mm. Mm. Lo and behold, (laughs) every day this woman brought me another child. So the first day, she brings me Kirby, and he is the cutest little thing. And How old is Kirby? When he's she... about seven at this time. Okay. Aww. Almost eight years old, something like that. Everybody wants to adopt Kirby. He's so cute. So the next day, she brings me this little tiny baby, three and a half months old, and that's Maranatha. Mm. And I'm like, oh, oh, uh, there's another one. <laughs> and she's well, like, wait, yes, this is Kirby's sister. Mm. And she's three and a half months old. And I'm, I said, so what is her name? And she says, her name is Maranatha. And I literally almost fell to the floor because Marvin has a sister named Maranatha. And that's just not real common. So that really just kind of crushed my heart at the moment. <laughs> and Maranatha has a special meaning. Maranatha means the Lord cometh. So Jesus is coming again. 
beautiful. So I played with this beautiful baby. She was so sweet, and she laughed. And I'm like, I'm emailing Marvin that evening. I'm like, there's two. And he's like, well, I'm going to have to pray about this. <laughs> and so the next day she brings, or, or no, I'm playing with the kids, and I realize that they have an older brother, Emmanuel. And Emmanuel is about 11 at this time. And uh, he is the sweetest young man you'd ever want to meet. And uh, at 11 years old, he still had not been adopted. At any rate, um, so I'm emailing Marvin again that evening. I'm like, there's three. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, the next day, I, I learned that there is another sibling, Rosemond. And uh, I'm sweating at this point um, and, because I, there's no way I could leave one behind. I wanted oh, wow. to keep the siblings together. And she says, oh, no, you can't adopt Rosemond. She, her father supports her and pays child support, so she cannot be considered an orphan. And I'm like, there was a who moment there because I didn't know what I was going to do with four kids. So yeah. at any rate, I, I did email Marv, and, and uh, he let me know that he would be praying about it. So mm-hmm. uh, seven days into that mission trip, we came home with the idea of adopting three kids. Just an idea at this point. It was just an idea. Okay. <laughs> um, and then and then, what prompted you? Tell me about how, where it came from the idea to the prayer. I mean, was there multiple conversations? Was there an aha moment? Was there, you know, head scratching at the dining room table? How are we going to do this? I thought we were getting a boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we did a lot of talking and praying about it. And uh, that was July of 2008 when I went on that missions trip. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently the hottest week ever in the in the ca- country of Haiti. Um, the girls will attest to that. Um, but uh, Marvin and I prayed about it. And we went back in September and he wanted to make sure that the kids were going to have a connection with him. And so, of course, the boys just fell in love with him. They're calling him daddy the minute mm-hmm. he arrives. And Maranatha is about five and a half months old then. And so she's just giggling and laughing with him and having a good time. And uh, he was pretty thrilled at their reaction to him. Uh, so come around November, uh, I went back again and with my dossier in hand and all of the... What's dossier? A dossier is all of the documentation that they require mm-hmm. uh, that tells about us, background checks. There's um, there's all kinds of things that have to take place in order to prove that we are who we say we are and that we're capable. Mm-hmm. Um, so I took that back and in November, the ball started getting ro- was rolling and... Uh, it was not until 2010 in January. You remember when the earthquake happened in Haiti? Mm-hmm. It was devastating. So much destruction. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people died in that uh, mm. earthquake. Um, so uh, the children, all of the children in the country that were already in the process of being adopted were released to go to their countries where they were being adopted to. And so it was because of that earthquake that my children came home when they did. Their adoptions were not even finished being processed yet. Mm -hmm. So they came to America on humanitarian parole, and Barbara Walker, back still in Haiti, and we worked on getting everything finished. And and about six months later, they were all, the adoptions were completed. Mm. It was horrific. So nobody got injured in that Ruska Village. Praise the Lord. God was, his hand was just over my children. It was all I could do is trust. I, there was nothing I could do to help them. I couldn't go to them. Everything was in destruction. So I had to simply just trust God to take care of my children and that they wouldn't be harmed and that they wouldn't be um, scarred because there was so death everywhere. Mm. But they were, they were sheltered from it. They, Iman told me later that they never saw a dead body. Nothing. Wow. They were sheltered from it. It was beautiful. The whole village, you said, was protected. The whole village. I think one child got a, a burn or something, and that was it. Nobody. And they had buildings falling, and it was it was bad. Now, you, as their mom over here in America, adoption's not quite processed yet. Um, like you said, you're trusting God for their safety. Had you heard from them? Was there an email? Like, were you able to check in with the orphanage at the time? I actually was in touch with Sheree Shropshire. She's the one that told me about them to begin with. Her father, Joe Hurston, is very good friends with Barbara Walker at Ruska Village. And so she was able to get word from them to let me know that the children were indeed okay, you know. Um, And she kept me in touch with them in order to get them home. 
I love how you said you were just trusting God for their protection. It's all I could do. Yeah. yeah. So it's the best thing I could do. <laughs> so they're they're in America now, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, her earthquake has is behind us. You bring them to America. What is life like for these precious children leaving Haiti, coming to America? Tell us about life well, in America. Well, it was comical most of the time. <laughs> these boys, Maranatha was very small, so she was 22 months old when she got here. The boys were um, 10 and 13, or just about to t- turn 10 and 13. So they were half grown by the time they got here. Mm. Everything was so magical to them. Um, we had roadways that didn't have holes in them uh, and big highways. Uh, the drive from Miami home, the boys were just glued to the windows. <laughs> I'll never forget it as long as I live. And when we got home, they were thirsty, and Iman would ask me, Mommy, dlo, that means ice. And he's, I'm like, okay. So I'd get the cup. And, of course, we have one of those automatic dispensers on the front of the refrigerator. He walked up, and I said, put your cup here and push and the ice fell out, and he's like, oh, oh, he was so amazed by, I wish he could see my face, podcast land. Right. But his his face was just so amazed because he never could have cold water, uh, you know, ice in his water there. And then I pushed the other button, and the water came out, and it was clean, and mm-hmm. they didn't have to go through a process of uh, decontaminizing it and all of those things. It was beautiful. A lot um, of things we so, take for granted. Yes, we do. Um, We had to go through a process of learning um, safety because they thought every single white person was good because every white person that came to the village was a missionary and brought them candy and brought them Jesus. So I had to teach them not to answer the door anytime Mm -hmm. they wanted to without knowing. I had to teach them not to put forks in the microwave. (laughs) I had to teach them what a countertop was. Here, son, put this on the countertop. What is countertop mommy? (laughs) Well, even that, I mean, you're talking about all these things that you're teaching them. I just assumed they knew English. They, they, Iman knew a little bit of English, just enough to make things a little easier. Do you know any Creole? Mm, Very little. Like, I know how to tell you my name is Selena. Can you you say that for us? (laughs) Um, Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. I don't recall. It was was (laughs) a long time ago. You'll think about it later. Um, so, so go ahead. yeah, it was a, a lot of teaching, just a lot of interaction. Uh, the uh, first day or so that they were there, um, I they would not eat anything but pizza and hot dogs. They hated American food. So I would fix up the hot dogs. I had to boil them because they didn't like them any other way. Um, and I asked Kirby, who is 10 years old, weighs 45 pounds, Kirby, how many hot dogs would you like? And he'd raise four fingers. I'm like, where are you going to put this food? <laughs> but he didn't realize that he was going to eat again. <sighs> and Holy Spirit really showed me these things. He, uh, I re- Right away, I realized what was going on. And so I put a little menu on the refrigerator and said, this is what you're going to have for breakfast tomorrow. This is lunch. This is dinner. Three meals. I hold up my three fingers. And so they learned that they didn't have to eat their whole supply in one sitting. Because in Haiti, they didn't know from one meal to the next when they would eat. So they put on weight pretty fast. (laughs) Life in America. Yes, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Um, But one of the most fun memories that I have is when we wanted to take them out to the movie theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, Iman called it cinema. So I would say, we're going to the cinema. Mm -hmm. No, mommy, my TV okay. Mm. And I'm like, my TV big enough, he would say, Mm. that big screen television that we had in the living room, you know. And I said, oh, but the cinema is so big and the and the sound is so good and he's like no no and uh I said okay I promise I'll never make you go to another movie if you will just go to this one and and he says okay I'll go so we went to see Percy Jackson the lightning thief and of course there's so much action and it's just the movie for a 13 year old boy to see right and he came out of there with saucers for eyes and was so amazed and I said well I guess we won't have to go see another one right and he's like yes mommy yes I want to see another one he was hooked he's hooked and this man will go see movies all the time if you let him of course he's an adult now so he can go as often as he likes (laughs) That is a sweet story. Um, so well, let's get back to what you're doing over in the Cocoa campus. 
you are you have your children. Um, your adoption has gone well. They're growing up. You're serving throughout various capacities in East Coast Christian Center. Uh, you've gone from Merritt Island to Vieira. Now you're at Coco Campus. Um, and your kids are still growing up. Tell me what what changes. I mean, your kids are growing up in America. They're being exposed to just life in general. They're uh, going through different seasons of life. Just tell us how your kids, how child rearing is going. Well, it's been over 10 years now since they've come to America. Um, Maranatha is the only one left at home. She's 11, and she's homeschooled in sixth grade. Um, but you remember Emon and Kirby, mm -hmm. uh, they were pretty heavily involved at the VR campus and uh, were serving there. They loved serving there. You could tell in yes. their faces. Oh, and you their, could tell. their smiles. The smiles. The million-dollar smiles, yes. I call them. Um, they were both attending Rockledge High School at the time, and uh, Iman was pretty involved in, you know, uh, working and, and doing his thing, and he did his level best. It was harder for him because he was older when he got here, so learning English and comprehending was more difficult. He worked very hard to make it through graduating high school. He was his first person in his Haitian family to ever graduate from high school, mm -hmm. so it was a really cool moment. Um, so Kirby, on the other hand, uh, began demonstrating some really strange behaviors, and uh, he began to tell lies. Anytime he was uh, faced with consequences for something that he had done, he would lie, and uh, he got to the point where he would um, he really believed the lies were true. Mm -hmm. um, he wouldn't make the necessary efforts to do his schoolwork and uh, he really had no pr problem bringing home an F, and I'd ask him, Kirby, why did you make an F on your homework? I didn't want to do it. Mm. So his attitude went from this sweet, adorable, loving child to this almost angry, mm. just re in a rebellion, and uh, really didn't understand where that was coming from. And How old is he at this point? You said high school, right? Yeah, so... high school. So he was about 15. Okay. Um, so uh, there were lots of things that he did in school. For example, his French teacher made him angry one time in class. And so to punish her, he failed. To punish her. To punish her. So nothing was connecting. Nothing mm -hmm. really made sense. Mm -hmm. So I really had to start doing a little investigation and uh, asking for some help. And uh, the first person I went to was Holy Spirit. And I just asked God, help me to see what's going on with this child. What's what can I do to help this child? So, you know, as moms, sometimes we have to do a little snooping to get mm -hmm. to the bottom line. And uh, I did. I snooped around in his room and I went through his backpack and I found um, a cell phone. And when I opened the cell phone, there was pornography. And so... Uh, but was that his cell phone? It was not his okay. cell phone. He said he had found it. And uh I believed him at that point, you know, it, you always want to believe your children. Sure. So yeah. I knew that there was a possibility that it was a lie. I chose to believe him that time. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew then that there was issues with pornography and pornography destroys lives. Mm -hmm. So I knew it was shame and guilt and all of these things that were coming down on him. And the enemy was working his little ears over all the time at how a horrible person he was, I'm sure. So I started watching. Uh, anytime a computer was in his, he would take every opportunity to be on, if he, there was internet available, that he would be watching pornography. So we locked up everything, but that really didn't stop it. He, uh, I, I would get these urges to just go and, and look in his room again, and I'd find another cell phone. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, they weren't all given to him, like mm -hmm, he said. Mm -hmm. But, um, he just became so, so unreasonable and so angry. And um, so I decided to go to his major. He was in JROTC, and he flourished in that environment. So I went to his major, and I said, listen, this is where I'm at. We don't really know what to do. And, and uh, I explained to him what we were dealing with, minus the pornography. I don't think I disclosed that to him. But um, he looked at me like I had two heads. Mm. And he says, I just don't understand what you're talking about this this kid is the best in my class. Mm. He, uh, everybody loves him. His cadets respect him. And so I left there with feeling like there, I had no idea what to do next. I would just mm. felt pretty hopeless at that point. Can I ask you, 
you mentioned um, screen time and pornography. How did you, besides locking everything up, what did you say to him about pornography or what he was doing and what did he say back to you? You know, um, full disclosure here, when I was in a previous marriage, um, pornography was a big thing in our marriage. It was a broken, seriously broken marriage. And so I knew Mm -hmm. firsthand Mm -hmm. what a pornography addiction looked like. And so I did not yell at him Mm -hmm. and I did not uh, get angry. And I sat him down and I said, let me tell you my story. Mm -hmm. And I told him about what I had experienced. And even after my, my, marriage ended in divorce, I still dealt with this pornography addiction. And so uh, I think that he appreciated that um, because he started to really talk, you know, and he's like, mommy, I don't want to be in this anymore. I want to be free. And the only thing that can free you of that is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I told him that, um, but he did not step in that direction Mm -hmm. to develop relationship with Jesus so that he could be free. Um, he had some seriously bad influences in his high school career that those influences kept pulling him back and pulling him back. You mean friends? Friends, okay. yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah, it was difficult. But um, So you address the pornography. You go to ROTC, his major, and he's like, I don't know what you're talking about, lady. Yeah. Kirby is the best kid in the class. Yeah. Everyone wants to be him. What happens next? We also sought help from several of our pastors, and they all sat with him and talked to him and tried to get to the bottom of things, but he didn't really want the help. Mm -hmm. And so unless somebody really wants to receive help and really wants to get healed, it's just words. They're um, wasted words almost, you know, Mm -hmm. that it just falls on deaf ears. Well, I definitely think seeds were planted Mm -hmm. um, for sure. Uh, I know sometimes we feel like they're falling on deaf ears. I think the words are seeds, but sometimes the ears are hard to hear. Um, But um, I'll let you go ahead and continue. Well, the last straw for us was when Kirby chose to steal from his brother. And it was another cell phone and Mm -hmm. another opportunity to watch pornography. And uh, this was four years into this thing at this point. So he had been grounded many, many times for his effort, no efforts being made in school or no efforts to follow the rules. Um, So at this point, I grounded him. It was the last time I grounded him, but I grounded him for stealing. Mm. And he was very angry. And he was so angry that he chose to not speak to me or anyone in the house for four months. Mm. It is very difficult to live in a home where one person chooses to be so withdrawn Mm -hmm. yes and not to mention that it's very hurtful coming from the mom because we're wanting to nurture but we're not receiving anything back from this child so did he say i'm just not talking anymore or it was evident because you would everyone would ask him something and he just was silent no and this was a behavior that i noticed early on that when he didn't get the answer he wanted he would turn his face away from me uh, we'd be in the car, and he would just turn his face to the window and watch out the window and ignore me. It was manipulative. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't fall for that. So I would ask him questions and make him mad and talk to me. And even during this four months when he refused, we would sit at the dinner table, and he would literally take a bite and turn his back to me, take a bite, turn his back to me, um, so that he didn't have to put his face toward me. Mm. And so um, I started asking questions. And he is, he too, when he's in front of you, he is willing to be um, under authority. So there's no, there's not many times when he would just say, I'm not going to talk to you or just stand there. Mm -hmm. Um, But at this point, that's where he was. I was asking questions and we literally sat in the kitchen and he just stood there and refused to answer my question. And I, I just pulled out my phone. I said, I'm like, I've got all day, son. <laughs> and I'm playing solitaire or something on right, my phone. Right. And he just stood there and stood there and stood there. You know, he was built to be a soldier because this boy did not move for Whoa. like 40 minutes. Wow. And finally, I just asked him to leave the room and go back to his room. So, wow, he's rebellious. He's angry. He's non-communicative. What do you do with that? Well, Marvin and I really just sat down and and looked at some options of what we could do. Um, But 
with our conversations with Kirby, at this point, he's saying I've never wanted to be adopted. Um, And I'm pretty sure that was just to hurt me, um, which it did. Uh, But we we find and he had these stories in his mind about what happened to him in Haiti. Uh, But Iman would come back and say, no, Kirby, that never happened. And he's like, yes, it did. He was firm with these stories of the six little six year old mind when he was finally ended up in an orphanage, um, was making up, I think, to protect himself. So Marvin and I decided to update his passport and put him on an airplane back to Haiti so that he could visit with his biological parents. And, uh, I'm going to tell you, after dealing with this mess for four years, I was ready to let him stay for a whole month. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But he just needed to stay for about two weeks, and I needed that time to breathe for a change. It could have been four years. It was a long time to be dealing with this for both of us. Um, So he did go back. He stayed for two weeks, and he had conversations with both his biological mom and his dad, and uh, they helped him work out the truth about his life in Haiti. And... That seemed to take a lot of pressure off of him, being able to understand that he was never abandoned. He thought he had been abandoned. Um, So when he came back, um, he he still seemed to be a little bit volatile, uh, and he still would withdraw pretty easily. He was 18 at this point and just beginning his senior year in high school, and honestly, Jeannie, I just didn't have it in me to do another year of fighting with this young man just to get him to pass. Uh, It was so arduous. Um, And he is a brilliant young man. He's so smart. So I encouraged him just to get his GED and to prepare to enter the Army, but he refused to do that. Anything I would suggest, he would do the opposite. So I, um, he only had two classes left to graduate, and he started and stopped those classes three times. So we strongly encouraged him to get additional work. Um, He really wanted to move. He had already tried to move out a year earlier or a few months earlier before he turned 18. And uh, he really wanted to move out. And so we encouraged him to get work. And he, uh, he had a job at that point and ended up getting another one, which was great. So it's almost like he had a full-time job making fairly good money. Mm -hmm. Um, He would give me the checks and I would deposit them into his savings account that was, you know, connected to our personal accounts because Mm -hmm. when you're a kid, you can't have your own savings account. Was that something he thought of or you thought of? Oh, no, it was before really all of this happened. He had a little savings account and he'd put money into it just to learn. We would encourage them to do that, to learn how to save. So it really worked our advantage at this point because he would yeah. spend it all if he had the opportunity. So I kept money going into a savings account and he would have a little bit of money to spend each week. So he had about a thousand dollars, I think, when when uh, all was said and done. So he's saving money. He's wanting to move out. What happens next? I I really I really wanted to see him work through this high school thing. I really wanted to see him get his GED and get in the Army, one of those things. But uh, he was determined to stay at home while longer, and so we said, okay. Uh, But then I started seeing these changes in Maranatha. Um, For example, uh, she's fifth grade, and she's not. She wasn't being... There was no consequences for getting an F on homework or getting a F on, t- on a test. This was her training ground. She hadn't been getting letter grades for very long. So she got an F on homework. And I said, well, Maranatha, why did you get an F? And she says, oh, the teacher lost my homework. Mm. And I'm like, that was one of the excuses that Kirby used often. Oh. <laughs> so I said, wait a minute. You realize that you're not going to be punished, right? There's no discipline for you getting an F. You're just learning about letter grades and and you're just learning how to do school and she says oh oh okay yeah no I just didn't want to do it Mm. which was another thing we heard him say often Mm. and then there were other behaviors where if she did get consequences to her behavior she would turn her face from me and she Mm. would mimic all of these behaviors that he had been demonstrating And that's pretty much where we drew the line in the sand. We just could not see six more months of him influencing her this way was too much. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see that happening. And he wasn't, he was, while he was a little better from after that trip to Haiti, all those other things, it doesn't just 
get healed overnight. Mm -hmm. So there was so much that we were still dealing with and still there were lies and deception. So we told him, you've got two weeks. He had two jobs, money in the bank. And I said, you have two weeks to get a place to live. Is that going to be okay for you? Yes, that'd be fine. I I have no problem finding a place to go. I said, that's great. So he did leave Mm -hmm. and, uh, it took time, maybe a couple of weeks, for him to spend all of the $1,000 he had in his pocket. He did sleep on some couches. Um, he eventually lost one of the jobs because he did not get up and go to work on time. Mm-hmm. So um, he, he ended up having a real, he was in a real pickle. And then what happens? He's He's in a pickle. I mean, do you... What happens, he's he's losing, going through his money, he's sleeping on couches. Um, what what happens next? Well, at this point, he had stopped taking our phone calls and our texts. He blocked them, but when somebody would ask, well, why aren't you answering your parents? Oh, I have no texts from them, and he would show them. Mm-hmm. I have no calls from them. Well, it's because he had blocked our phone numbers. He had worn out so many relationships at this point. He had so few resources, and uh, nobody really went on to take him in because he was habitually lying to everybody, and they pretty much, eventually they figured this stuff out, you know. Mm-hmm. So he chose to sleep on the ground instead of calling us and saying, I, I'm in a pickle and I need help. He just chose to sleep on the ground. And not too long after that, he lost his primary job as well um, because he couldn't get to work on time. I I suspect he didn't sleep very well on the ground. Mm. And you've got to sleep with one eye open when you're homeless. Mm. So every morning, Jeannie, I would pass by. uh, I would drive down Murrell to go to my work, and I would see him sitting out on the Starbucks porch Mm. um, playing on his cell phone Mm -hmm. because that was the the big thing in his life, Mm -hmm. having a cell phone. And uh, one morning I was driving and he was walking down the sidewalk toward my direction and I noticed it was him. And so I I turned around real quick and I came back and I parked in a building parking lot facing him and I just sat there and watched him. Mm. And my heart just, it was so heavy for him. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. okay. Um, So I just sat and watched him for a few minutes and, uh, and then he stopped and he looked up and down the street And when no cars were coming, he tossed his backpack into these high grasses. And it was then I knew for sure that he was homeless because he didn't want to go to his friend's house with a backpack full of everything he owned Mm. because that would be embarrassing. And he'd have to admit to people, oh, yeah, I'm homeless. Um, You're you're cheering up just talking about it. And thank you again. I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your story. And this is where we're going to end our discussion for now. Part two of this series is available also. We do want you to listen to part two as we do not want you to miss the end of it. Thanks for listening to the East Coast Sisterhood podcast. For the latest details on all things sisterhood, visit us on Instagram and Facebook at East Coast Sisterhood or on our website at eccc.us slash sisterhood. And never forget, you are sisterhood. Sisterhood.